Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to HydroTerra's most recent webinar. Uh, today's topic is all about how we can use direct satellite connectivity to improve the way we monitor water. Uh, we're lucky to have Dan Franklin from Miriota here Hi. to share with us the progress that's being made in this area and uh, also to work through some of the challenges they've had to overcome in terms of functionality and that sort of thing to maximize the opportunity to use this sort of connectivity with our to, to monitor our water supplies it's great to have so many people here today and thank you very much for attending all right so a little bit about our presenter. Well, we've sort of got two presenters today, myself and Dan. I'll be giving you a little bit of context about where the world is at and why organisations like Miriota are emerging. Um, so Dan is an accomplished senior account manager at Miriota. And Miriota is a great Australian success story in terms of embracing this chat this challenge of new satellite connectivity that's emerging. So Dan's got over 15 years of experience in the technology industry. He's passionate about driving innovation and digital transformation for Miriota's ecosystem of partners and establishing himself as a trusted advisor and strategic partner. Miriota itself was founded in 2015, so not that long ago to revolutionise the IoT through simple, secure and affordable access to data anywhere using advanced direct-to-satellite technology. Miriota IP covers all aspects of end-to-end -end solution, edge satellite and cloud. And Dan will help clarify what some of those terms mean in his presentation. But Dan, many thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having us. And uh, apologies that my camera's not transmitting, but um, at least we can see you, Dan. <laughs> Before we charge into the details, we love your questions and thanks very much for the early bird questions that have already been sent through. Dan will do his best to answer these questions. Obviously, there'll be other questions that will come to mind during the presentation. Please use the Q&A button uh, at the top of your screen, type in your question, and I will read those questions to Dan at the end of the presentation. Before we get into things, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which we meet today, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, I also pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Why does HydroTerra run these webinars? Well, we're passionate about sharing knowledge. We like to facilitate education. I think it's really important that we're sharing knowledge on technology. Uh, it's such a, a growing area and, and evolving area as is environmental management itself. So that's really what drives our motivation there. And we like to lead industry in terms of helping to make you aware of emerging technologies and their application. And certainly today's topic is, uh, is profound in the, in the way that it is transformative with these new satellite networks and how we can use them to monitor water. Okay. So what's it all about? Uh, and is this really new? Well, we've been doing it for a long time and we ran a webinar back in 2021 with Matt Saunders from Unidata. If you want to have a look at that, um, you can go onto our website and see that. That provides you with a bit of background. Um, but for a long time, we've needed to transfer sensor data into central computers. And for a long time, we've been using various telemetry options. Uh, we used to call it telemetry. Now, we, these days, we call it IoT. If you come from an IT world, you love embracing the term IoT. 
if you come more from the traditional instrumentation end of things, like calling it telemetry. Obviously, there's more functionality in the world of IoT with all the software that's being developed. At the end of the day, from an instrumentation point of view, we're trying to get information from sensors through a telemetry network and into a centralized data storage and computer. So what are the elements of these telemetered networks? We've got instruments and sensors, which ultimately are measuring those parameters that we need to decide are important. Typically, we have a data logger that's consolidating those measurements to some degree. Then we have a communication system, which is really important in the context of today's discussion. Somehow we need to communicate with these, these telemetry networks or those telecommunications platforms. And finally, we need the data to come out of those and come into a centralized computer. So the world of companies like Miriota are trying to make that sort of journey pretty seamless and to work with integrators who can uh, assemble and put those systems in the ground. And that's part of what HydroTerra does on a daily basis is, is work with industry to help put those sort of networks together. A couple of terms that are important to understand what a network server is so that it handles those communications and the data flow. And we have application servers, which is more about displaying the actual data. So uh, you can see it. In terms of just a bit of context around telemetry, well, there's obviously many telemetry options and certainly a lot of our customers require some advice on which options to run with. There's a general trend towards lower costs, which is a good thing, but there's also more complexity with the number of choices. Um, some of those choices are sort of listed below. You know, for a while there, LoRaWAN was really seen as the thing with the smart cities networks that was going to change the world. Then the cellular networks started to really drop their prices and people started thinking, well, there's more support with those. And then the satellite side of things has really gone through a revolution where previously it was probably considered the expensive option to use. But these days the price is coming down. So what are our satellite options? Okay, so back in the day, in the old days, sort of the first big satellites that were put up were known as geostationary satellites. And if you have a look at that previous webinar we held with Unidata, there's pretty good explanation that Matt Saunders put together from Unidata. But these ones, they really orbit the Earth a long way out, you know, sort of up to 50,000 kilometres out. And they're what we call geostationary satellites. And uh, they, they are really orbiting the Earth around the equator. So, uh, and you can actually use them uh, in a lot of good situations, but where you run into trouble is where you have sort of bumpy terrain like that picture on the left there. So you can get into a situation where it doesn't matter where your receiver is in that valley, it can't see that signal from that geostation satellite. So there's been a revolution that's been happening. I'm going to show you a slide of the number of these satellites in a minute. But this revolution has been around these low Earth orbit satellites. So these ones are nowhere near as far out and they're becoming smaller and smaller in size. So if you look at, compare the altitude that these things are spinning at, um, these ones are less than a thousand kilometers above the Earth. It might sound like a long way away, but it's nothing versus, you know, that sort of 50,000 to 35,000 kilometers away uh, that the geostationary satellites are at. Uh, and these lower Earth orbit satellites, they, they go around the uh, Earth rapidly. Uh, so in one day, you'll typically have about 11 orbits per day versus those geostationary satellites, which are going around the Earth at the same speed as the Earth's rotation. So effectively, they're stationary. Why is that a good thing? Well, these if you look at this schematic and you see these low Earth orbit satellites, it means because they're doing multiple passovers and there's lots of them up there, 
you've got a better chance of communicating with them in this sort of more bumpy terrain. So in summary, we're getting better coverage for our satellite communications. In terms of support for these networks, they've both got good support, right? So they're both managed. It's a bit like when you, you know, sign up for a SIM card, you've got a, a managed SIM, managed SIM. Well, in the it's the same, same deal with these satellite networks. So really from that side of things, there's not much that differentiates them between the geostationary and these lower earth orbit networks. They both have network management, they both got pretty, they've, they've typically got big companies behind them that manage those networks for us, um, which is good because it's a complicated technology space. Uh, in terms of pricing, the, the low earth orbit satellite networks are coming down significantly in price. Why? Well, they're small and you can put a lot up in space on, you know, less number of rockets. So uh, we are now in a situation where we're getting, if you look at the sort of size scale, so there's, there's some definitions that we found of, of size of satellites. The, um, a lot of these, site, uh, these satellites that we're sort of talking about today uh, what we would call nano satellites, so one to ten kilos. Uh, one of the networks that's growing quite rapidly at the moment is Swarm, for example, and that photo off their website just gives you an idea of the size of their satellite. So really, they're very small, and you know we are putting lots and lots of them up in space. How many? I hear you ask. So this is a this schematic, um, and sorry, I've, I've the, the reference to that is just listed up the top there. Um, if you look at the sort of blend of who's actually pumping satellites out into space, you know, if you look over there, uh, this is really a split of who, who's owned them. A lot of them in the past were sort of owned by governments and universities and research organisations. But then around 2013, we really started to see a shift towards companies, private companies, prizes getting involved in these LEO networks or these nano satellite networks. And you can see there has really been an explosion in the number of satellites out there since about 2013, and it's continuing to grow. So, um, significant numbers of satellites being launched every year. Why is that important? Well, it means the world's changing. And it means there's opportunities emerging with that change. So in terms of these LEO networks, there's a great opportunity to lever off this additional coverage to improve how we monitor water. So who are these companies who've been putting all this effort into getting satellites? Well, one of them is Miriota. They're a pretty small part on this graph. In fact, I can't quite see them. Others who are growing uh, or launching lots and lots are, for example, Swarm, for example, have got lots of satellites out there. Um, it's fair to say that there's lots of um, companies putting these up into space. And there's a bit of a race going on. So really the purpose of my introduction was to try and clarify to the audience what's changed and why there's an opportunity. So the LEO coverage is up. Okay, lots and lots of satellites going up. And the costs to actually access those networks are coming down. Now. That's part of the opportunity, but the complexity comes with this, that there's different sorts of capacities on these networks to take certain sizes of packets of data that you might want to send up. There's limitations on the frequency that you can send these things. So when you're choosing um, which 
networks to use and that sort of thing, it's best to give us a call and we can run through those options together. But the world has changed in terms of satellites. It's changed a lot since we presented to you in 2021 in terms of these LEO satellites. So a good opportunity to be considered. So one organisation that's really embraced this opportunity is Miriota, and it's, a, it's an interesting Australian story of how you know, Australian companies managed to get some government backing and really embrace this opportunity. Um, so the race is on, and Miriota's embracing that race, which is how can we use, you know, sensor networks, particularly in this case for this topic, internal EO satellite networks, and then display that data or share that data back to the clients that need it in an efficient way. And uh, you'll see from Dan's presentation that there's a bit involved in actually achieving that. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Dan, uh, who can continue the presentation. Well, thanks for the introduction, Richard. Um, it's quite a, a very in-depth overview. So I've been with Rio for 12 months now. Um, you are right in terms of um, satellites up in the sky. Um, we are we are lower um, than some of the others out there, but we're we're um, not necessarily a, a satellite company. Um, we utilise um, space as a service um, for that, but there's other areas that we can talk through later. Um, but I'll run through some of the environmental water challenges um, concerns that Rich has touched on alongside some of the practical applications um, for our connectivity solutions um, in order to optimise water resources. So I'll just start with a bit of a, a background and history on Miriota. So we have a deep heritage in telecommunications research. We had a first wo um, a world first transmission of IoT data, which was direct to nano satellite, uh, which was achieved in 2013. So nanosatellite, as um, Richard mentioned before, is that one to uh, 10 kilos, um, so about the size of a, a shoebox or a, a loaf of bread. Now, some of the additional goals um, that were laid out and subsequently achieved were around very low power, um, along with the ability to extend both the, the global satellite and terrestrial footprints. So essentially it was about being simple to build, uh, simple to deploy, simple to maintain, um, with end-to-end -end secure communications. So simply put, uh, being able to connect anything, anywhere. Uh, we currently have around 40 countries that are enabled for service and more coming online to meet the market demands. Um, and along with our, our patents and um, around the technology, uh, there are multiple use cases in various markets. Water monitoring obviously is a perfect example. Um, it covers many verticals across that in ag, in mining, and in construction. Uh, so our vision statement, which is the core of what um, our company um, believes, um, and that is a world that's made better through seamless access to critical data anywhere and everywhere is needed. If you just skip on to the next slide there, Richard, please. So we all know that um, water is what keeps us and our planet alive. Now I've increased, so I've got my water here, uh, with increasing demand for drinking water and increasing extraction of water, uh, be it industrial or agricultural use, the knowledge about water levels, um, water usage and water loss is obviously essential. So IoT communications technology is changing the way that we protect our most critical resource of water. Despite it being all around us, Usable fresh water is incredibly scarce and is often in remote locations which fall outside of terrestrial connectivity networks. So I'll run through with you how we can solve the challenge of protecting this vital resource by providing IT connectivity and data anywhere on earth um, to monitor water across a range of applications. And just to lead on from our earlier vision statement, 
Our mission is to provide tangibly better outcomes for all the partners in our ecosystem. And we do this through simple, affordable and uh, access to data anywhere. So just skip on to the next slide there, please, Richard. Thank you. So before I get into some of the challenges that are, are solved via direct satellite connectivity, um, oh, sorry, I think we're just one. Can you skip forward one more, perhaps? Yep, we've got two hours. I think that's fine. We'll, we'll go back one in a minute. Um, so before I get on to yeah, the challenges um, that are solved via direct satellite connectivity, um, here's a simplistic overview of how the Mariota network operates. So here we're using a water truck as our asset. However, that asset could be um, stationary or mobile, as um, is the case in this example. So the arrows lead from the truck, um, illustrating a oh, two-way and back up to the satellite, um, showing that this provides two-way connectivity. So the two-way communications allows for us to transmit firmware updates, um, configuration, and in the future device commands. Uh, so this means that the device is uh, updated as soon as new satellites are added to the network. Um, going back to that um, space as a service. Um, so as these um, satellites come on board, we're able to then um, bring those on board for ourselves, which significantly aids the improvement of latency. As Richard mentioned, these satellites are, are low Earth orbit, so they're, uh, they're not remaining fixed or on a single point. Um, instead, they're, they're revolving around the Earth as it tra uh, travels along its own orbit. So our particular satellites are sat at approximately 500 kilometers above the ground surface. Now we utilize um, VHF and UHF frequency bands um, as this provides the best um, radio propagation conditions for direct to satellite IoT. The reason for this um, is that VHF and UHF frequencies have lower free space path loss than other frequencies. So therefore we're providing a more reliable link um, that's being created because the signals stay strong for longer distances. The low path loss um, also allows for low transmit power and long battery life. So these frequencies are less vulnerable to um, signal quality reduction due to um, poor weather conditions such as um, clouds or rain or snow. Our modules then further um, aid the long battery life by staying in sleep mode until our satellites are overhead. Uh, we use a, a store and forward protocol which queues the messages on the module until the satellites are within range. Then once the satellites are within range, the module awakes and then starts to transmit in those messages. Uh, the satellites can also cover a radius of about 3000 kilometers, which makes it extremely easy to have a line of sight and collect messages when they're sent. To put that into perspective, a satellite over the, cent uh, the centre of Australia would pick up the whole of the country. Uh, once messages are received by the satellites, um, we transmit the data down by our network of ground stations uh, to our uh, network of ground stations, and then the data is exported out via a RESTful API to be visualised by the end user. And next slide. I think the next slide should be fine. So we're on the challenges. Um, so yes, before looking at the water industry specifically, um, here are some of the global challenges that you'd see and would potentially be familiar with when trying to deploy an IoT solution. So firstly, terrestrial networks or cellular networks such as 4G or 5G, not currently, um, co currently cover only 90% of the Earth's surface. So depending on the technology deployed, you may have to install your own ground infrastructure or network equipment um, and also ensure power to these systems. Higher power demands for devices mean large batteries, um, solar capability, or potentially line powered solutions for long term use. Uh, we then have cyber attacks and hacking, which are obviously a constant threat these days. And then there's the time required to integrate devices into visualization platforms and analytical tools. So all of this can make analyzing the, the return on investment extremely difficult or depending on the infrastructure needed, simply too costly to warrant the implementation. So if you just skip to the next slide, Richard. Did you want me to go back to that earlier one on the water? Sorry. No, I think I've kind of talked through that anyway, so that's fine. Okay. Um, so how does a, a built for IoT satellite solution get past these barriers? 
Well, firstly, with direct-to-satellite technology, there's uh, no requirement for ground infrastructure. Uh, you simply install the device and let it do its work. <clears throat> so from tank and uh, groundwater monitoring to trough and river monitoring, um, the network and connectivity provides a low cost, um, low power and secure network anywhere on the Earth's um, surface, again, utilizing the, the low Earth orbit satellites. So the design of our particular network means there is less power required to transmit the data. So again, given that long battery life. And to put that uh, to, uh, into a bit of perspective, from two standard AA lithium batteries, which you could buy from your local Bunnings or hard store, hardware store, um, you could expect to receive five plus years of life on a device. Uh, on the security front, um, we've built an encryption from the module to the Myriota cloud, and then from the cloud to the endpoint destination, the solution is built around zero trust. And our APIs and the data delivery make the integration to the visualization platform nice and easy. All of this presents an affordable, low maintenance, ease of installation package um, to counter the, challenging, the challenge of sourcing critical data from any location. Next slide, please. So when looking at the challenges specific to water, there are some key points to identify. And apologies that some of this um, is reiterating what Richard said, um, but many usable freshwater sources are located in remote areas and outside of terrestrial range. They're off the grid and they become a significant challenge to monitor. And again, I think Richard touched on a few of these statistics, um, but they're, they're key to point out. Um, UNICEF um, reported by 2025, 50% of the global population will be living in areas facing water scarcity, which is a, a really distressing figure to be presented with. And as reported by National Ge uh, Geographic, only 3% of global water is fresh water, and most of that 3% is in glaciers, um, permafrost, or underground, meaning that only 1% of it can actually be utilised for drinking water. Uh, we then have the agriculture industry, which ut utilizes about 70% of the world's accessible fresh water. Uh, but some 60% of this is wasted due to leaky irrigation systems and inefficient application methods. As well as this, we have the cultivation of crops that are often too thirsty for the environment in which they're grown. If we then add into this tight business margins, it means that every drop of lost water counts. Next slide, please. But as we all know, um, with every challenge comes an opportunity. And in highlighting the many, many challenges that facing the water industry, uh, you can turn your focus to solutions that both protect this resource and create substantial business opportunities. So as a capital intensive industry, water management must pay close attention to the utilization of water and the performance of the equipment that is relied on. Through satellite IoT te technologies, um, they can present the opportunity for massive uh, economic growth, as well as uh, resource sustainability. With satellites covering the globe, um, remote areas are no longer a challenge. With monitoring in place, the ability to eliminate global water loss, which as reported by the Department of Built Environment Finland, accounts for an estimated cost of $39 billion US each year. And according to Bloomberg, by 2027, the IoT-enabled um, smart water metering industry will be worth 6.4 billion USD. So needless to say, um, automating water metering represents significant benefits for a range of industries operating across a large um, ge uh, geographically dispersed locations. Um, another stat here that um, National Geographic reported that 99% of usable water is underground. Uh, this mostly untapped resource uh, must be utilised in a sustainable way. And satellite IoT connectivity enables that with access to reliable and more frequent data. So based on the combination of anywhere connectivity and sensors with big data and AI technologies, be it water utility operators, um, farmers, companies in general um, all have the ability to achieve less waste, less consumption, um, and improve management of this precious resource. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here we have some examples of what monitoring via Miriota or other direct satellite providers can do for the water industry. So we have um, location monitoring, particularly on mobile assets, uh, like emergency pumps um, and mobile water tanks, which can provide data for position on maps, location reports, uh, insights on usage and uh, optimization of resources. You can receive non-critical notification, so if assets have been moved for their intended location, or help to reduce theft of temporary pumps um, or remote equipment that can often be misplaced. Uh, solutions are available to the entire water system, so whether that's um, being for tank and dam levels, uh, for monitoring of tank and dam levels, uh, be it pump efficiency, uh, monitoring rainfall, or water metering, uh, grain uh, water usage and water, uh, water quality too. So the additional, inf uh, additional information provided by these remote devices can help with the increase in regulation and compliance, providing more accurate and readily available trend data on various water usage. Having the ability to monitor for contamination or pollution in a remote location uh, that otherwise may not be known for extended periods of time proves added safeguards to clean water and help to min minimize any impact. Again, a key component of all is that all of this can be achieved at low cost uh, compared to traditional satellite options for an industry of ever increasing costs and uh, tight profit margins. So I'll now jump into a couple of particular use cases. Thank you. Uh, so firstly, uh, here we have Grunfoss. Uh, Grunfoss is the largest pump manufacturer in the world today. Uh, many of their pumps are in many diverse and remote locations around the globe. <clears throat> Miriota worked with Grunfoss to create the Solar Connect tank and Solar Connect pump monitors which also include a data visualization application. These are durable uh, sensor units that are built to withstand some of the most harsh and remote environments that water is found and used in. The devices are a simple uh, plug and play product that close the data loop. So through our connectivity, we can provide end-to-end -end oversight of the pump status, uh, the pump volume and the tank level, all being carried out remotely and without any cellular connection or in infrastructure. The devices receive the data and then use edge computed computing to send that data from any location. So here we've got um, some of the, the pain points uh, that were faced and how they were resolved. So the farmers struggle with labour shortages, which have a major impact on how they uh, prioritise their work and monitor key resources. Uh, we requ required a solution that freed up labour to be best utilised elsewhere on the farm. It's inefficient in time and energy to manually manage all the pumps and the equipment in remote areas, again reducing on um, return on the investment. And so the Solar Connect devices solve this by sending the data to a simple, easy to use app, providing the exact information daily to the farmer without a trip to the remote site. Without this reliable data on the performance of their water systems, farmers may not know for some time if there are issues with the water supply. So the farmer now uh, has complete peace of mind, knowing the pump is working and performing. Uh, they can see the flow rates, the power from the solar panels, the runtime of the pump, and now they only need to visit the pump for any regular maintenance or if they see that a problem has occurred. To make all this happen, uh, the installation has to be simple. The device with the pump we built connects a couple of wires to the existing pump and our edge processing module then reads the data and packages it up to send. The low cost device is also self-contained with low power usage runs on a couple of AA, um, couple of double, yes, uh, AA batteries, uh, lithium batteries for up to five years. Um, to provide a real life scenario of this, um, we had a farmer that installed a similar product to monitor the animal's water troughs um, using a tank monitoring device and a sensor. After a few days of implementing it, uh, the farmer had an alert that the trough was empty. As he'd recently been out to site, assumed the device was faulty and initially was going to call us to complain. He didn't first go out to check the trough. Um, it was in fact empty as the pump had stopped working. Uh, for him, this was a, a simple fix to get the water flowing. However, as 
ordinarily he'd only have checked those troughs every two weeks or so. Had he not received the alert uh, with no water, his animals would have been stressed or potentially could have even died. So this is a, a pretty powerful story to show how the access to this critical data can have a positive environmental impact. What's the next one, please? So this second example um, is actually here in South Australia, but could also be relevant um, to anywhere else in the world. So the South Australian uh, Department for Environment and Water, they're, they're utilising a satellite data connectivity to monitor groundwater levels, which is a vital resource that accounts for two thirds of water here in South Australia. In the past, uh, monitoring groundwater usage required a manual read of each bore water meter which is obviously a, a resource intensive task given the size and remoteness of this part of Australia. To put that into context, um, currently only 6% of DUW's 3,500 bores are instrumented, meaning that bore information, uh, observation information, is collected only a few times a year from a number, number of bores. Uh, this data could be six to 12 months old potentially before a scientist gets to review it which makes um, informative decision-making extremely difficult. Now I'll run through a few of uh, the pain points that are encountered here and how they were aided by satellite connectivity. So if you aren't aware, uh, South Australia is very large, it's very remote and a very dry state. Vast areas of this state are without any terrestrial connectivity. So with global coverage, it meant that no site was too remote and a single solution could be used for all of the sites. The manual process uh, used by the organization initially was very resource intensive, which resulted in long windshield time, uh, remote workers, and also with increasing fuel costs on the trucks to get there. The Miriota network has removed the need for expensive manual meter reading. And while having a more regular data feed, because the technology is low power, the device can also remain untouched in the field for up to four years. So the cost, complexity and scalability of terrestrial IoT solutions, uh, like putting in place cell towers or gateways would have presented another challenge. And often there's no ROI on that type of investment. So by working with one of our partners, uh, the Department of Environment and Water now has an automated uh, satellite IoT solution that's been easy to install, it's cost effective, it's reliable, and can withstand the most remote harsh environments into which they're deployed. And to add to this, uh, new legislation has been introduced uh, requiring a need for more accurate and readily available trend data on groundwater usage. So the regular data that's now available um, offers this um, being far superior trend analysis and more insight uh, into the water than ever before, which obviously is a great result for everyone. The next slide, please, Richard. I won't stay on this one for too long, um, but here's a, diver a diverse range of our current partner devices. Um, just show that there are solutions that are, are market ready um, to provide significant improvement and efficiency in uh, water management whilst aiding environmental sustainability. Thanks, Richard. And so in summary, um, there are multiple um, competitive advantages for using direct satellite connectivity for monitoring uh, water, whether that be Miriota or other suppliers that are out there in the market. You're able to connect anywhere on the planet with significantly lower power consumption than existing satellite options that were previously on the market um, and also still potentially on the market today. Um, with a network that's designed for billions of devices without changing the performance of the network. In terms of Miriota, so our network uh, provides pole-to-pole -pole coverage and orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes. Again, as I said, uh, with each satellite covering 3,000 square kilometers. Um, our messages are encrypted from the device all the way to the end user, so we've no sight of the data being sent, nothing sent in the clear, um, taking a, a zero trust approach to the security. Uh, means that um, users can operate with confidence in the network, knowing that there's no security issues and the data is always safe. So I um, encourage uh, anyone listening today to reach out to myself or to Richard and the team at Hy uh, Hydroterra with any questions or specific needs that they may have. 
Um, thank you for having me, and I hand back to Richard to move on to some of the questions. Well, thanks very much, Dan, for that. Um, it provides us with a great oversight of where Miriota is at and some of the applications that are well suited to these LEO satellites. Before I um, continue with the presentation, I've got a couple of questions for you. So it seems to me oh. that um, the spot measurement sort of data, so, you know, pond water level and groundwater level where frequency may be, you know, three or four times a day seems to be the, you know, best niche. Uh, for what Myriad is currently doing, is that correct? Or yeah, um, look, I guess to an extent that is correct. So um, we're designed for small packets of data collection. Um, so whether that is where is my asset, um, what is the volume being pumped, um, what is the pressure on a pump, um, what is the level, whether it's threshold um, level measurements um, for groundwater monitoring, for example. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, currently we're sat at 48 messages a day that can be sent. And again, that will grow as our network continues to grow. Um, so it, it really depends on, on what the requirement is and, and how you want to package up that data to um, transmit, uh, obviously, at the, the lowest cost available and being able to compact that data as, as best possible into the, the smaller uh, message bytes that are available. So whether that's um, still could be taking reads every 15 minutes potentially, um, but then gathering up that data to send in, in bursts as the satellites are available. So is it fair to say um, that this sort of technology is good for monitoring, but not good for control because the timing on you know, to, to actually send commands to switch a pump off in response to, you know, an observation is going to be yeah. delayed, waiting for the next opportunity to transmit and that sort of thing. Is that is sure? That a Look, I guess for where the um, where we are in the industry currently, um, yes, you'd be correct in in that. Um, however, look as as we work the network towards a point of of more real time. Um, latency, then yes, that will open up more opportunities. And as I touched on earlier, we are um, moving towards um, sort of control and bi-directional communication. Um, so as the latency reduces, providing that control obviously will will open up more opportunities. But yes, if you if if you're looking for real time tomorrow to be turn, to turn off or on a pump, then you may need to look at um, other connectivity options that provide that, but then there's the requirement potentially for other infrastructure to be in place. So it's, it's trying to find, I guess, that point in the market of what's available and at what cost. I certainly think it's got a great niche for monitoring those pond water levels, like with the Yabby sort of technology yeah. and monitoring groundwater levels, because typically groundwater, you know, it's it's never urgent i can say that because i'm a hydrogeologist yeah <laughs> typically you've got a bit of time right so yeah um, well as i said with the um with the example with the department of environment and water you know they went from uh getting data every six months to now um yeah they're getting four to six messages a day so they're getting real data yeah so just um the audience's point of view, where HydroTerra comes into working on these sort of networks is that there is a need, a real need to support these networks. And um, as the number of sensors and things out there grows and grows and grows, there's a need to be able to field the alerts and things that come through from these sensors. Um, and there's also a need to be able to visualise the data in a more and more customized way to sort of meet what you need in terms of reporting. So that's how we work in with these partners. So just going back to an earlier slide here, so part of Miriota's model is that they can't do it all themselves. So they actually actively work with partners and it's great to see quite a few Australian companies 
that have um, you know built the infrastructure to allow this um, adoption of the Miriota platform. So Yabby, for example, is one that we're now actively supporting, um, and that allows you to really have real time dam water levels. And we see there's good applications in mining as well as uh, in uh, you know just stock dams and also in landfills for leachate level monitoring. Um, and these these solutions are modular. They don't need to be collected to mains power, that sort of thing. So they're actually a really good uh, solution where you've got, got to measure that water level. And Yabby's done a great job of configuring a pressure transducer under a floating buoy, for example, which makes deployment really easy, makes it a lot easier than mounting to a rigid structure next to the pond, for example. So good practical applications then. And Sapiro has been doing, um, I'm not sure if Sapiro is listed here actually. Um, they're another, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, they're, they're another one that's put a lot of effort into configuring for groundwater level. Um, and we're also ourselves doing quite a few options around that for connecting to these micro satellite networks from monitoring wells. The critical thing. With the, with the groundwater sort of configurations is just to keep an eye on practical things like what's the size of your well monument and how can you mount, you know, that, that actual RTU unit on the top of it and how do you protect it from things like stock and that sort of thing that like to rub against it or cockies that like to chew the aerials. <laughs> cockies are probably the biggest barrier to technology adoption in Australia. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to sort of go back to this slide to show you where some of the good practical applications are already happening in this. So things like... Yeah, and to, just on, on to that point, Richard, um, yeah, we, we very much are about providing sort of the communication aspect um, for our partners to then utilize that within their own sort of niche market or product field that they see, um, as, as Yabby is a great example of that. So I might, um, so, so just summarizing across here, the applications that already, uh, you know, microsatellites are really helping with are location, right? What is yeah. where? Yeah, um, so... Yeah, the Andromeda there in the top left is actually a, a dual cellular and uh, Miriota networked device. So depending on where the, the asset is located at any, any point, um, we'll actually choose the best available network. So essentially it's using cellular 90% of the time. And then when it falls outside of that cellular uh, capability or availability, then it will trip onto the Miriota network. And what about this egg bot? What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, Agbot, um, uh, one of our pretty long-term partners, um, they are providing their tank level monitor. Um, so they also have a gas bot, um, which again is for the gas monitoring, uh, but essentially yeah, again providing um, available data for monitoring um, water tanks that would only previously been available by someone actually physically going to site and taking a read. In terms of the rain, rain side of things, so tipping bucket rain gauge data can come into those, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah. So one of our partners, um, Goanna, has um, previously um, had a product called the Go Rain Sap, um, which was essentially a tipping bucket um, so that um, yeah, farmers could tell if certain areas were, were getting more rain than others and then obviously um, how best to cultivate crops depending on that. Okay, so just in summary for everybody, this sort of technology I think is really good for spot measurement data, the groundwater and water level for surface water bodies. Um, it's obviously also got applications for tracking where devices are. Um, probably the most mature service provider out there um, in the agriculture sector has been Goanna. They've had a, they've got this well and truly adopted across many, many sites. Um, we're actively partnering with Yabby these days. So we'll be supporting sort of micro satellite networks 
for monitoring both groundwater level and surface water tank and ponds. Um, and as um, as as integrations, further integrations with sensors go, we'll be able to add other things to that. But they're probably the core things to look at. This is a cost effective option um, for for monitoring, and the costs of uh, now the actual telemetry have come down so much that satellite is becoming a pretty good option in nearly any location, really. Yeah, well, as I said, because of the fact that you don't have the requirement for any ground infrastructure, um, that really lends itself to that kind of low cost as well. Yeah. So we had some early bird questions. Thank you for that. Um, I think this one's related more to satellite imagery as distinct from yeah. satellite communication from sensors. So how can the satellite image be validated with field data? But in terms of if someone's in the field and they're looking at, I guess, uh, groundwater level, uh, it is possible to do a manual dip measurement and compare that reading with the reading you're getting in real time out of your system. Um, typically, you can log on via your phone to look at those readings and you can do a direct comparison there. So. Um, that's the beauty of this connectivity, right? It doesn't matter where you are, you can cross check what your reading, your last reading has been versus a field measurement. But in the case of the applications we've just looked at then, uh, pond, pond level stuff, I think it's always good to have a staff gauge in there so you can do a manual check against what's being produced in real time. Um, sometimes it gets difficult if people are converting level data to meters AHD and you're out on site and you don't have a conversion to do a direct direct comparison. But that can all be set up you know, in the way you visualize your data so you can do those direct comparisons. I hope that answers that question. I suspect you are looking more for stuff related to imagery like NDVI and that sort of thing. Um, next question, number two, how can you validate satellite data given the cloud coverage? Hmm. I think that might be similar to the previous one. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I can kind of answer to this somewhat on the cloud aspect. So due to the frequency um, that we use, cloud coverage isn't particularly a problem if it's that cloud you're talking about. Um, and the probabilistic algorithms that are used in, in sending our messages. Um, so without going into the full science behind it, um, due to the, the probabilistic nature of how the messages are sent is what allows us to hit our SOAs. So in terms of cloud coverage affecting a transmission, how much of an effect is cloudy weather on actually transmitting those? Yeah, um, look, the, because of the noise level of the UHF and VHF frequencies, um, they essentially, the reason that we utilize that is to actually break through that noise and, and take out of account things like bad weather. Um, more, more, the things that are more likely to actually play into effect with um, our kind of data transmission could be something like uh, canopies or being in ravines, um, somewhere where you've got, um, it's impacting the direct line of sight. Um, so again, if it was against a, a, a large steel fence or um, underneath um, canopies of trees, they're more the sort of things that we need to take into account um, when deploying a device as opposed to the weather. So as a rule of thumb for people deploying these things, right? So I don't know, say it's a monitoring well. Yep. What would be the angle out from the monitoring well that you'd want to have clear line of sight to... Yeah, yeah so essentially, it would <laughs> the, the most perfect um, deployment would be in the middle of a, a flat field. Um, but we know that often that is not the case. Um, you know, we have mountainous regions, we have um, yeah ravines because we're, we're monitoring water. Um, so all all that will happen is because as soon as you narrow that window, it just is reducing. Um, the success rate of those messages going through. So whilst again, the, um, the module learns to um, acknowledge where the satellites will be passing and what time they'll be passing, 
Um, and then it's because it's probabilistic, the messages are then sent multiple times. So you are just as likely to get your message through in a, a more secluded spot. Um, but what you might see is that because it's having to send the messages more frequently to try and hit that, uh, that positive send, that it may impact the battery life. If you didn't, if it wasn't connected through battery, then that potentially doesn't impact if you were going down solar. Um, but if it was in some of the cases like the Abbey device with um, the AA batteries, um, to have the most successful deployment, yeah, you want a better line of sight. And we, we supply um, all the documentation around kind of how best to, and you know, pointing upwards, not down towards the earth is, is better. Okay, thanks for that. Um, question three, landscape rehydration. What is the lowest cost of water generation, remote monitoring systems and analytics software? Okay, so I think if we said, what's the lowest cost of remote monitoring systems and analytics software? Um, the you, water generation. Are you happy for me to answer that one? Beg your pardon? Are you happy for me to give a bit of an answer? Yeah, to that? go for it. Yeah, okay, because it, it is that is quite a fairly generic question. Um, it depends obviously on what's being monitored through whom and with what. Um, and again, on, on how much data. So, like like most things out there, the, the more you require, the more you pay. Um, so, you could be looking at anywhere from you know cents a day up to dollars a day, up to um, hundreds of dollars a month um, with hardware that could be anywhere from yeah thousand dollars to multiple thousands of dollars. So, it, it it's quite a generic um, question and really. Um, Reliant on what the exact requirement in that particular area, and again with with analytics, um, dependent on whether it's a basic requirement of you know the one to four reads a day, or whether you're actually needing to drill down into more real time data. So again, a fairly generic answer for a generic question, but yeah, very varied, but definitely um, lower cost than probably what used to be out there on the market. I might add to that. So in, in terms of costing up a system, um, the approach that Hydroterra has adopted is we're creating a bunch of modular sort of configurations and depending on the need, you know, we'll have costs associated with those, but it does sort of highlight the, the need to answer this question because what tends to happen is um, there's a million sensors that will measure the desired parameters you need and you need to choose particular sensors. So your decision on what sort of sensor comes down to the, the materials that it's built out of and that comes down to, well, what's the type of water that you're deploying in? So the first question is, okay, the lowest cost option that's going to last a long time is probably what you're trying to get at so then you have to ask the question well what level of accuracy do you want around that and that's where you you know you, so even the first choice which is what sort of sensor it might be stainless steel it might be plastic it might be titanium so there's it comes down to what level of what longevity are you after what level of accuracy and then you start looking at uh, price to keep price down but retain reliability, what, what we've adopted philosophically is less is more. So we try to configure more bare sensors in the networks now. So bare sensors don't really have a data logger down a hole, uh, quite often don't have a power supply down a hole either. So you start to simplify the deployment of sensors um, and rely more on the telemetry network or the RTU, which has the data logger and that sort of thing. So then the next part of this is really for a telemetry unit, how frequently do you want to send data? Okay. And depending on that frequency and how big the data set is determines what sort of network you should use. So you have to make multiple choices here or multiple decisions to choose the optimum price. I always try and encourage people to think about what do they really need 
right? So often people get distracted by specs and things on systems rather than actually thinking about, well, what's the measurement frequency they really need and what's the urgency of that signal? So to save money, it's a good idea to plan it out first. And if you can answer those two questions, that drives, well, what's the cheapest way to get a reliable message out in the time frame that you need? In terms of costs of actually transmitting those messages, um, you've got to weigh it up against the amount of data you can send out at that time. But, you know, mobile phone telemetry costs have come down a lot. And there's some global sort of cellular SIM charges that are incredibly low. I was going to say ridiculously, but I've got to take advantage of them. But those prices have come down a lot. And these sort of micro satellite options uh, have come down significantly too. So um, in general, I'd say telco costs have come down a lot. Um, the reliability of being able to transmit out when you need to, um, cellular network can be more reliable. Finally, you get to your data visualization piece and we offer different levels of visualization, which really relate to different software packages that are available that we can configure to. Um, if it's part of a standard configuration, then obviously that saves money because you don't have to do any bespoke scripting. So if you can get a modular solution that can be plugged straight in, that becomes the most cost effective. If you're looking for bespoke where you're wanting to federate data, well, you tend to have to pay more money for that sort of thing. So that was a fairly long-winded answer. But uh, what we're trying to do at HydroTerra is offer both bespoke solutions and modular solutions. Modular solutions cost less. Um, bespoke solutions are better suited for a particular application. How's that, Dan? Is that a good answer? It's a great answer. <laughs> All right. Uh, number four, remote area monitoring and sampling for bores, flow level and tailings dams. How effective are LEO satellites, e.g. Starlink? Dan? Um, I can't talk too much for Starlink because it's a it's a very different service and different price point to Miriota. So Starlink um, is essentially providing um, satellite broadband. Um, so yeah, they come, I, I'm sure for its use provides um, a very attractive solution, but yeah, it's again, a significantly different cost. Um, you, you need to have satellite in the area, um, so a bit more like your old traditional Foxtel, for example. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't give too much <laughs> more of an answer on that because having not, not utilised Starlink. So, I mean, maybe um, I think Starlink might be sort of a, not the example of a, of a LEO satellite, but no, you know, something like Swarm or you know, Mariota itself, I think they're very effective at providing level monitoring for tailing stamps. I think it's an ideal application. Yeah. Uh, it's probably, yeah. you know, best use scenario, tailing stamps and, and bore levels. In terms of bore flow, I'm assuming you're meaning uh, from a pump attached to the bore. Um, how many sort of applications have you had uh, where they're measuring flow, do they just transmit total flow or do they measure, you know, sort of more of a real-time flow rate? Or have you done much in that um, area? Uh, I ha haven't. Um, I wasn't actually involved in the Grunfoss um, dealings, but I believe they're monitoring flow. Um, I'm not sure at what whether that's like a daily flow or whether it's um, broken down hourly. Um, but, they're, yeah, they're definitely um, measuring flow. Um, in terms of sort of the, the cost effectiveness of that, um, again, I suppose it's come down to how important is that data to you and if it's being delivered a sensor day um, versus not having that data, then perhaps that provides the, the requirement for you. What's the frequency you can send out at the moment with the satellite? 
network you've got. So if someone was measuring flow and the flow stopped, what's, yeah. what's the sort of best case they would in terms of frequency of knowing? Yeah, so currently our, our latency is around the three to four hour mark. Um, we'll see that dropping significantly over the, the next 12 months. Um, more than happy to share that information offline. Um, to what about to online, Dan? <laughs> how, what, how, how much do you think it's going to drop by roughly? Oh, look, we're... In the next 12 months, we will be looking to get under the sub one hour mark and then moving towards sort of closer to real time. And real time for us would be sort of that sub 15 minutes. Um, and that would be on the, the sort of our, our roadmap of the next sort of 18 to 24 months, I'd suggest. So the satellites you're using to achieve that sort of reduction, uh, is that more about utilizing other networks that are up there already and sort of sharing that infrastructure or are you launching a whole lot more satellites um it's a mix it's a bit of a mix so yes we utilize um some um, systems are already up there um so yes um satellite as a service um one of our, our partners fire global um, they've actually successfully launched 150 satellites so being a, a partner of ours um, they're actually one of our investors um, we've utilized them for um, satellites as a service as well as having our own devices launched um, and there'll also there's also a, a launch that's anticipated for later this year um, with the south australian government which will see the the first satellite um, departing our shores here so I think we better move on to the next question, Dan. We've got quite a few that have come into the Q&A, so I've got to keep cranking along. Um, we're a little bit over time already. Are you happy to keep going for a bit longer? Yeah, fine by me. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone, for these questions. So last of the early bird questions, will the new satellite system utilise and or expand on the existing on-ground water monitoring network? Happy for me to say that one. Yep. So I'm not sure um, exactly what the question is here and what the specific network is being referenced. Um, but if you're if you're looking um, to monitor from the existing network, there'd be some level of uh, integration required to be able to transmit via satellite. So it's not you can't sort of um, hop from one network to another. So um, so looks at uh, Grunfoss, for example, uh, the, um, we were then, obviously they've got pumps that are already out in the field and they did have some monitoring available on some of those, um, but we um, essentially utilised uh, an RS-485 forward along with our device, um, which has an antenna to then be able to, um, to transmit data from um, an existing um, infrastructure that's already in place. Um, so in terms of sort of expanding on existing, um, yeah, but as far as I can tell from the question, only based on um, some form of additional modification to what's already in place. I think that's a good answer. So I think uh, if, uh, say for groundwater in particular, obviously there's you know things like state observation bore networks and a lot of existing bores, like there's literally tens of thousands of, of monitoring wells around. Um, these provide a good low cost way of getting more time series data from those existing wells and that can only be a good thing okay it's kind of really sad when you've got to do a project and you look up you know these monitoring wells and then you you get excited that you've got coverage and information and then uh, you actually go into the records and there's no data for the, the levels so uh, yeah. i think we're expanding on existing infrastructure for sure all right, on to the Q&A side of things. This one's from John Simons. What's the approximate cost per bore for CapEx and OpEx? So this would be for telemetered groundwater system. Yeah, um, well, as we're not the end supplier, so um, whether that was Sapiro, for example, um, that would be... Yeah, that would be a, 
as a period question or potentially a hydro tariff question? Yep, we provide lots of different options for, for these. Uh, if you give us a call, uh, depending on the scenario of how deep the groundwater is, because cable length affects hardware cost quite significantly, and the frequency you want to transmit depends or on uh, the whether or not you need an enclosure above ground. So those two things really drive a bit of cost consideration. If you need an external enclosure, what's the frequency of transmission? If we can just use batteries and we're running with a modular solution, then they are very low cost option. Um, but it does depend on the depth and it does depend on what parameters you want to measure. And Phil, we'll come back to you with some estimates of operating cost and uh, and level costs. All right, here's one from Eaton Dan. What is the ballpark cost number for the HW? Hardware. Hardware, sorry. Hardware. And annual description, for instance, zero rain gauge and soil moisture probe. So maybe uh, in terms of your annual subscription for what are your charges running at, at the moment, Dan? Um, I probably wouldn't divulge that <laughs> because <laughs> like, it's, um, so we, we um, it depends whether we're working obviously directly with someone who's looking to manufacture a product, then you um, get a wholesale rate. Um, our partners, however, like Hydroterra, where they're providing um, the full end-to-end -end solution with visualization, um, et cetera, obviously is going to be at a different price point because you're, you're getting a full solution. So, um, yeah, again, it could be dollars a month per device up to a, a much larger figure if you're paying for a full um, hardware and software solution via um, an, an organization like yourself, Richard. Yeah, so look, in terms of generic sort of numbers for you, if you're doing data visualization and you're wanting to be able to do things like um, also visually portray that, so not just a time series graph, then you're probably looking at about a dollar a day for that visualization side of things, uh, which includes hosting, telco side of things as well. If you're just after time series data, and an, an ability to send an alarm, then that price is less. Um, if you're after us providing a support level agreement to receive those alarms and actually keep an eye on your network, then we charge more for that service. Um, so in terms of the hardware sort of things, there's a whole range of different sorts of tipping bucket rain gauges. In terms of soil moisture, we typically use something like the Iramax network which is um, not so suited to going through this particular sort of micro satellite platform, for example. So I think uh, once again, uh, happy to take those ones offline and just get the specifics of your application. So it's a little bit hard to answer those ones directly, um, but happy to give you some modular pricing against things like the groundwater level, that sort of thing. Um, can this pick up water usage from the water meter? Yes. Good answer, Dan. <laughs> Simple, yes. Um, Karen Fairweather, would the Yabby floating level sensor be suitable for deployment in, say, a tailing storage facility or process pond? For Absolutely. Uh, it, and it has been and is being deployed in those applications. So uh, we're using them for that and also for leachate ponds, but they're being deployed a lot on mine sites because they're uh, nice uh, in those remote areas, right? And they're easy to deploy because they're buoy mounted and the pressure transducer hangs below the buoy on the ground, right? On the, sorry, the base of the pond. So the, the buoy itself can go up and down with your changing level, but it's measuring the pressure above the sensor. So that's really quite clever. 
So that's a sh that's for a yes for sure. It's a really good application. Um, what is the typical latency time for satellite transmissions across Australia? Yeah, I think we touched on that one before. So currently around the three to four hour mark. Yeah. And reducing moving forward. Uh, next question in steep gorges. So yeah, we're a bit more, a bit less. Uh... Yeah, again, um, it comes down to line of sight, um, dependent on how steep. Uh, there's lots of caveats and things around that. Um, and in some cases, it will it will simply be um, a, a test to see. Um, it's not the ideal scenario to be in an exceptionally steep gorge with very, very limited line of sight. Um, but if at the same time, if, if we're not able to get down there by satellite coverage, um, the only way to get down there is going to be to actually have some form of infrastructure at the bottom of that um, gorge, which probably is not going to be cost effective either. Right. Um, next question, Aaron Smith. G'day, Aaron. What solutions do you have for groundwater use and metering? I can answer that one. So in groundwater use, obviously we've got groundwater level monitoring and depending on where you are, you would adopt, you know, potentially this sort of satellite telemetry or you might just use cellular, exact. We can federate that data. So you can actually plot up in real time things like um, total groundwater storage, drawdown, that sort of thing. All those things can be done. In terms of metering, we've got plenty of networks where we've telemetered to various flow meters, whether it's to the totalizer or whether it's to the actual flow at a point in time. We do both of those as well. Um, in terms of transmitting that flow data using a micro satellite network, I would need to check on that frequency and how we would handle that given um, costs to send various volumes of data. But certainly all of it, pretty much every aspect you could think of for groundwater use can be covered, even down to things like, is the pump on or off? That sort of thing as well. So that can all be useful. Um, Luke Peel, how are you, Luke? Um, mentioned low cost a number of times. Can you provide some indicative cost estimates, please, for measuring tank or troughs in grazing systems and monitoring pump operations? Luke, I'm happy to provide them to you. We'd be offering the Yabby option for tank level. Um, that's That would be the way we would be going with that. I don't have those prices in front of me. Probably should have been quite a few questions on price in this webinar. Um, so that brings us to an end of the questions. Many thanks to Dan for attending today. That's been fantastic. And I uh, really appreciate your time. And many thanks to everyone who's attended today. It's been great to see so many people hanging on for the questions. Thank you, Dan. Thanks very much, Richard. All the best and have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone.